Good evening. Welcome back to our second night of St. Monica's Lenten Parish Mission, Standing at the Cross with Our Lady, St. John and St. Mary Magdalene. I thought last night was wonderful. I hope you did too. And I got to listen to part of it this morning, and I think you're going to be really excited about tonight. It was, it was really awesome. Um, tonight, the title is Contemplating the Cross with St. John, the Beloved Priest. And as promised, we will give you another opportunity to contribute to this mission in which all the proceeds will go to the Pious House community in Tyler, Texas, which is the community that Father is starting. It's the community, um, and just to give you a little more information on it, this is a community for diocesan priests to live in the, in the spirit of St. Philip Neri. So they live in community which I think, you know, all of us can agree that our diocesan priest needs the support of each other. And to be able to live in community um, is just a great gift. And I'm very excited about this, this community. Um, so I really do thank you. And if you are able to contribute financially, um, they can definitely use it. But we also need to ask you to pray for them, to pray for them and for the success of this community. Um, and also, thank you so much for your donations of both financial and prayer. Uh, and just a reminder about tomorrow. So tomorrow we will have a 6.30 p.m. Mass before the mission and confessions as well from 5 to 6. So um, it's sort of our normal schedule times, but not normal on a Wednesday, all right? <laughs> Um, and I'd also like to ask you to please pray for our parish missions, um, our current ones, our future ones, for all our speakers, and for those who attend as well, that your hearts will be open. Um, we can't make parish missions successful without prayer, so please pray for us. And now, without much further ado, Father Andre Metrajan. In the name of the Father and the Son the Holy Ghost. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry for our banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, the eyes of mercy towards us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. Remember, most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known, that when it fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought the intercession, was left and aided, inspired by this confidence, to fly into thee, O Virgin, O Virgin, our Mother. To thee do we come, before that we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother, the Word incarnate, despise not our petitions, thy mercy, hear and answer them. Amen. St. Joseph, St. John, the beloved disciple, the guardian angel of the Archdiocese of Atlanta, the guardian angel of St. Monica's Parish, all our guardian angels, and the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. Today I'd like to focus on uh, St. John, the Apostle, often known as the Beloved Disciple, often also known as St. John the Evangelist, often, also often known as St. John the Divine, the Theologian. So let's go over St. John's bio before we learn from him how to pray. St. John uh, is a brother, as we know, of James the Apostle. And both John and James, by the profession, were fishermen, and they did this with their dad, Zebedee, and their mother was Salome. Now, it seems from the Gospels that even though Peter and Andrew were fishermen, and James and John were fishermen, it seems as if, from some of the clues we receive in the Gospels, that James and John were a little more prominent in society than Peter and his brother. They seemed to be a little more educated, a little more well-connected. So they were both fishermen, uh, but it seems James and John were from a, a, a family a little step above the family of St. Peter. Now, John the Baptist uh, was probably, along with Andrew and with James, a disciple of John the Baptist. So our Lord called him. He was already following John the Baptist at the time. And we know that he is the youngest of all the apostles. That's why in art, he's often uh, depicted as the only apostle without a beard, 
with long hair, or to show his youthfulness, his zeal. So we're not quite sure, theologians disagree, on how old John was when he began to follow the Lord. Some say he was 18, some say he was 25, but they all agree that he was a virgin, that he consecrated his virginity to the Lord. And we know he died around somewhere around 100 AD. He was the last apostle to die. And with him, divine revelation ceased, right? Public revelation, everything God wanted to tell us uh, through our Lord, through the church, publicly, uh, ended with the death of the last apostle, John. Now, John was part of the Lord's inner three. Talked about this weekend at the Transfiguration. Out of the 12, there were three that were the most special, right? Peter, James, and John. They're the ones who went up the Transfiguration, Mount Tabor. They're the ones who went to the inner part of the Mount uh, Cassinomy and the Garden. They're the ones, only three of them saw the uh, the resurrection of Jairus' daughter. Right? They were as special privileges the others didn't. And they seemed to parallel and fulfill the prophecies of Moses. Moses um, was in some sense by his ministry and action, he was a foreshadowing of Christ. He was a, what we call a type, a type of something in the Old Testament that points to, that foreshadows something in the come the New Testament. So Moses, when he went up the mountain, he had three of his main followers, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu. Aaron was his high priest. Like Peter is the high priest of Christ. Like Peter is the vicar of Christ. Aaron was the vicar of Moses. And they all said Nadab and Abihu. Remember our Lord, in addition to having the three, he had the 12, the 12 apostles. In addition to having the 12 apostles, he had the 70 or 72 disciples that he appointed. And Moses too, as you remember, his brother-in-law, his father-in-law Jethro advised him to appoint 70 uh, assistants to help him in his legal cases as a judge of the people. And so Moses had the number three with one high priest, 12, 12 tribes of Israel, and 70, 70 disciples. So our Lord used the same numbers. One representative, one high priest, Peter, three main guys, Peter, James, and John, 12 apostles, and 70 or 72 disciples. It's very clear that our Lord is saying that his kingdom is the new Israel, that he's establishing a new priesthood with new tribes, this time not based on genetics, not based on bloodlines, but this time grafted on, the Gentiles are grafted on to the new Israel. So Peter, excuse me, James, John, brother, had many special advantages and special graces bestowed upon him. We in our age, oftentimes, we're very egalitarian. We don't like the idea that some people get more graces than others, right? But that's the way God has designed everything. But God is glorified in hierarchy. Now, God always gives uh, and, and offers the grace of salvation to all. Christ wants all to be saved. Christ wants all to go to heaven. But not everyone in heaven will be equal. Our Lady has given more grace than us, right? Our Lady has given more grace than all the angels and saints combined. God is glorified in that hierarchy and that diversity. So we should be happy for John that he was given these special privileges. So most notably, his privileges extended to the Triduum, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. Now, those three days, uh, even though they're three separate days, three separate events, are really in many ways mystically one event. You cannot separate and parse out Good Friday from Holy Thursday from Easter Sunday. And we see this in the liturgy. Right? In the liturgy, the priest does not give a final blessing on Holy Thursday. He does not give a blessing on Holy Friday. He doesn't, he doesn't give a blessing until Easter Vigil. This is one event, one liturgy. And they, none, none part of the three days makes sense without the other. So every three of those days, John was given a special privilege. On Easter, excuse me, on Holy Thursday, he was given uh, the privilege of putting his head on the heart of our Lord. No one else was. The whole Last Supper, the first Mass, his, his heart of Jesus it, it, resting on it is John's face. 
John's body. John is listening to the heart of our Lord. Think about the significance of, of what that means. Remember our Lord, he said in Luke's gospel, I've come to cast fire upon the earth and how I wish it was a blazing. Of a baptism, he says, our Lord said, with which I wish to be baptized and how I am constrained until it happens. Our Lord said that. He was not talking about his baptism of of John the Baptist because he was already baptized at that point by John the Baptist. He meant his passion. To be baptized means to be immersed. Christ had a hunger and desire uh, to go through his passion for us. He hungered and, and desired to suffer for us and to cast the Holy Spirit into our hearts. And so John, at the Last Supper, our Lord's taking hit the host, right? And John's head is on his heart. And John hears the heart and feels the heart of Jesus beating more and more. Our Lord is excited to say, this is my body. He's excited to say, this is my blood. There's a common heresy today that's very common. Uh, and this heresy says that mass is the representation of the Last Supper. False. Condemned. Mass is not the representation of the Last Supper. The mass is the representation of Christ on Calvary. Christ's sacrifice on the Calvary, on the cross, is made present again, present anew. Re, not represented, but represented. And so the first mass, the Last Supper, Christ is looking forward to the next day. And all the other masses to follow, we're looking backwards. It's one event, and we can't separate the cross from Christ. And John can hear the priestly heart of Christ desiring to die for us, desiring to pour out his blood uh, for us. Not formed. That was a seminary, right? That those few moments of hearing the Lord's heart was more formative than, than years of, of theology textbooks. As he came to know uh, the heart and the mission of Christ. And then the next day, a, a Good Friday, John was the only one who was given the, the participated with the grace to stay at the foot of the cross. No one else of the other apostles did so. Probably he cooperated with the grace to stay there because he was so in tune to the mystery of the Eucharist. So many times we receive the Eucharist and we just flee. We flee and we don't soak in and we don't marinate in those graces the Lord gives us. Remember one time in seminary, it's going through a hard time, and I began to after mass just to sit there, after mass, just sit, just sit. And just those, those moments of giving thanksgiving after mass, letting our Lord marinate into the soul, into the body. Right? Uh, I saw a big, big transformation in my life just by sitting there in thanksgiving after mass. So Holy Thursday, his head was on the heart of our Lord. On Good Friday, he was at the cross. And on Easter Sunday, he was the first one to see out of the apostles, the tomb empty. Peter and John ran there together, but John got there first. And he looked in and he saw, it says in this gospel, the linens. He saw the shroud of turn. He saw the shroud of turn laying there. But he didn't go in, so he waited for Peter. So he was the first one to see the empty tomb. Not long after, maybe 15, 30, 20 days later, all the apostles, most of them are in a boat, in Peter's boat, fishing. Peter needs time to get out into the nature to kind of uh, decompress and figure out what's been going on in his life the last few days and weeks. He goes back to do what he always does. He goes to fish. And our Lord begins to walk on the shore. And the first one to recognize him is who? John. Dominus est. It is the Lord. And Peter jumps into the boat. Notice how John leads Peter to the tomb, but he waits for Peter to get in. John points out to Peter, uh, Christ, and Peter jumps out. The relationship between the priesthood and the papacy. Right? Sometimes the priesthood will get there faster um, than the papacy. Sometimes the saints will get there faster than the, than the Vatican. But, John is reverent enough to not go into the tomb without Peter with him, for Peter to confirm the miracle of the resurrection. 
John is also given the privilege of writing uh, five books of the New Testament, right? His gospel, the three letters, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, and the book of Revelation or Apocalypse, as I prefer the old classical way to say it. It sounds better when you say Apocalypse. So out of all the New Testament writers, he wrote most of the New Testament books, except for Paul. Paul wrote the most, the second most written by John. And our Lord has given the great, great, great privilege of housing Mary from the cross. It was very hard for our Lord to speak, right? Every breath took from him an intense amount of intentional effort. Your lungs were depressed because you're, you're, you're hanging. And so to, to, to speak, you have to pull yourself up. So you, you don't accidentally say something. It takes, it takes painful effort. And our Lord from the cross pulls himself up and says to John, behold your mother, woman, behold your son. The great gift that, that John was given, that we were given through John, housing our lady. And so he lived with her and took care of her for a long time until she died, was assumed body and soul into heaven. And you think every day John would say mass and what would he do? He would give our lady holy communion. Imagine what was going in to John's heart and mind when he would give our lady Holy communion. The flesh of Christ is in his hand, that flesh that came from Mary, that came from her womb. He gives it back to her. John was given the privilege of taking the dead body of Christ off the cross and placing that body in the arms of Mary. John, in many ways, is the proto priest. Notice that many of the great saints that promoted the priesthood. Throughout the history of the church, we're named John. St. John Chrysostom wrote a beautiful work on the priesthood. St. John Vianney, the patriotic priest. St. John Eudes. St. John, uh, John of the Cross. St. John Martha. Many of these priests who promoted the priesthood were named John. Remember we said yesterday, there are many Marys of the cross because every Mary is a daughter of the real Mary, the new Eve. And John is kind of like the proto-priest. And every other priest it's conformed in his heart. And therefore, Mary, when given to him, is also given to priests in a special way. You're very blessed to have a, a pastor who loves Our Lady. It's very obvious, his passion for Our Lady. That comes from John, from the cross. After Our Lady died and was assumed into heaven, body and soul, he continued his ministry as apostle all throughout Asia, so Asia Minor specifically. It seems like 2 John actually might have been written to the Iranians. And he went through all of uh, Asia Minor, appointing bishops and priests, checking on people, stomping on heresies. In fact, there was a heresy during his time that denied the divinity of Christ. A heresy by this guy named Trinithius, a very evil man, who denied that Christ was indeed God. One day, John happened to be in the same building as this guy, and he, he couldn't take it. <laughs> He told his padre, his uh, compadres, let's get out of here. <laughs> he didn't want to be in the same room as the disgusting heretic who denied the divinity of Christ. And so he, he fasted and asked everyone around him to fast. And as a result of that, he wrote the Gospel of John, specifically, uh, in some ways, to combat the heresy that this crazy guy, Trinitius, was, was, was formulating. And to fill in the gaps for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, left out. I know that John also, out of all these privileges, will also give him the privileges of seeing uh, something, a glimpse into the end times, the understanding of the mass, understanding of the Antichrist, understanding of Christ's second coming, understanding of what it means that the church is Roman through the book of the apocalypse. And some saints, doctors of the church, Robert Bellman, among others, say that John was actually assumed body and soul into heaven when he died. Now, that's not dogma, right? It is dogma that Our Lady assumed body and soul into heaven, that you have to believe by divine faith. It is a common opinion or a very common uh, idea that Joseph was also assumed body and soul into heaven 
It's not a dogma. It might be one day. And it makes sense. In the Old Testament, Joseph, the patriarch, his bones were buried where? In Egypt. And when they crossed, the Israelites crossed into the Holy Land, whose bones did they bring with them? Joseph. So if Joseph was brought, the old Joseph was brought into the Holy Land on earth. It makes sense of the new Joseph. Body was brought into the new Holy Land of heaven. So we have to believe Mary was assumed body and soul in heaven. We're pretty sure if I bet in Vegas, <laughs> I bet that Joseph's body is in heaven, right? And, and, it, and it's a pious belief. You don't have to believe. It's a pious belief that John's body was assumed also. But again, that's not dog. So how do we pray like John? How do we pray like him? It first starts uh, with purity. Remember in the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure of heart for they shall see God. Our Lord has a love of purity. Our Lord loves chastity. There's a saying that the corruption of the worst, excuse me, the corruption of the best is the worst. Um, something that's made to be uh, honorable and good when it's corrupted, it's worse than other things, right? The devil was the highest angel. So that's when he fell, he became so evil. And there was, a, I think, a previous uh, priest who became the president of Haiti. And he left the priesthood. And I think he was, he was into the occult, nasty stuff, right? He left the priesthood and became filled with evil. Right? And so sexuality is a great gift that God bestowed upon Adam and Eve on the sixth day. Be fruitful and multiply, right? He, he, he made them in a covenant of marriage. He gave them that great gift of sexuality. It's made to glorify God in marriage, the covenant of marriage. So when it's corrupted, it leads to so many problems. That's why our Lord loves purity. And so notice that he also loves specifically a special form of purity, especially loves consecrated virginity. Those who consecrate their virginity for the kingdom. So his birth, excuse me, his ministry, his ministry was prepared for by who? John the Baptist, who was like a virgin who took vows to be a virgin. Remember, he lived as, as almost like a monk, very ascetical, living on, on locusts and honey. Uh, he, he lived only wearing ham, uh, camel's hair, and we're pretty certain he took a vow of virginity. Our Lady, the one who gave him birth, we know from St. Augustine, was a vowed virgin. The angel Gabriel came to that, her on Annunciation Day, March 25th. She said, Mary, you will conceive and bear a son. And she says, how could this be? The only thing that makes sense, why would she say that? She's betrothed. The only thing that makes sense of that question is if she had made a vow in the temple to consecrate her virginity to the Lord. And St. Joseph was aware of that. And actually the mystics and other theologians have confirmed that. They're a lady from a young age. Some say as young as three years old. Mary went to the steps of the temple and she gave her virginity to the Lord. And Joseph, who was betrothed to her, was aware of that. So his, his, his ministry was prepared for by a consecrated virgin. He was born of a virgin, right? And his most beloved disciple was what? A vowed virgin. He wants to highlight uh, the, the beauty and dignity of consecrated virginity. Um, being a virgin uh, and consecrating that for the sake of the kingdom. St. Philip Neri, who we're trying to aspire in our community, and we failed, we failed because he only, he never ate meat. <laughs> Sometimes he eat like one potato a day. <laughs> like St. Philip Neri, you're like, oh, so big. We're so small, we're so weak. He prayed all night sometimes. He was a beautiful saint. He rose people from the dead. He, when, my, can I tell you my favorite story of St. Philip Neri? So he liked to do exorcisms, you know, he, not like to do it, he just do it. Like someone was possessed and he just touched them. He's so holy and the devil would go away, right? But sometimes it wasn't clear when the devil would go away. Sometimes he would, he would touch someone and the devil would be speaking to the person. Oh, I hate you, Philip. Oh, oh. And Philip didn't care. He had a sense of humor, right? And eventually the demon would go away. So one time this woman was possessed in church <laughs> and he grabbed her by the hair and he spit in her face. <laughs> Because he's spitting at the devil, right? He's not spitting on the woman. He's spitting on the devil. But, but, but he didn't realize by the time he, when he, as soon as he grabbed her, the devil went away. 
So she kind of woke up and like, why are you spitting in my face? <laughs> I love this verse. But he loves chastity. And he was given a special grace. He could smell when people were unchaste. And the more unchaste they were, the more they smelled like rot and he could barely stand it. St. Philip Neri was given what's called the stigmata of the heart. We know about Padre Pio. Padre Pio had the the wounds of Christ in his hands and his side and the feet. So did St. Francis of Assisi and many other saints. They had the stigmata. St. Philip Neri had a special uh, stigmata called the stigmata of the heart. One day he was praying in the catacombs where the relics of the saints were. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit came upon him and he was pierced in this ecstasy his heart was pierced uh, by the Holy Spirit, and it physically grew. When they did his autopsy, uh, they found out his rib cage, like physically, uh, it, it broke and like changed shape. And it was like it was protruding his rib cage. His heart literally was four or five times bigger than the average person. It grew physically, and his heart was so big you could hear it be beat, be beat. You mean a confession? You can hear it beating. And sometimes it was so beating so fast, you'd get hot. You had to unbuck, unbutton uh, his cassock in, in the surplus. The Pope had to give him permission not to be able to wear, he didn't wear one of these in confession so he could cool down. His heart was full to the passion of the Lord. And when someone struggled with unchastity, but they wanted to stop, he would take them and then put their head in his heart, almost giving them the gift of chastity to them. Like Elijah passed on to Elisha, his, a double portion of his spirit. Of uh, Philip Neri, he loved chastity. He hated unchastity, and, and he was really uh, um, uh, vigilant about helping his penitents to make sure that they remain chaste. So John was given all these special privileges, probably because of his chastity. And he was given these chastity to get the chastity for the sake of these privileges. This is why he was close to the Lord of the Last Supper. This is why he was able to handle the body of Christ from the cross. The virginal body of Christ was taken down on the cross, handled by the virginal hands of John, placed into the, the, the virginal hands of Our Lady. The psalm said that the Son of God, his body would not seek corruption. And John carried, after, after Our Lady mourned enough, right? She was crying holding the dead body of your son, uh, our Lord. And think about John as you're just, just watching this. And then he grabs the body from her, breaks it to the tomb, and he sees Mary prepare um, the body of Christ, wiping up the blood, being very, very deliberate and loving of preparing his body for burial. Right? It's from Our Lady that John learns how to offer the Mass well. Our Lady was not a priest. She was given more grace, more sanctifying grace than all the saints and angels combined. We can't even fathom how intense Mary's love is in her heart. But even though she's the highest, she's owed hyperdulia, she was not given the grace of priesthood. But she did offer from the foot of the cross her son to the Father, was a priest who he offers Christ to the Father. She handled the body of Christ So John saw from her tender love how to celebrate the Mass with love and devotion, how to take care of every little particle, and and, and to cherish our Lord's body with with just carefulness and love. I had a priest uh, friend who was kind of a mentor uh, for a long time. He was getting his doctorate in Rome, and he would go say Mass every day for the missionaries of charity, Mother Teresa sisters. And he said, by seeing them at Mass— he learned how to celebrate Mass. They always celebrate Mass. It was clear when they were at Mass, they knew they were at the foot of the cross. They knew this was not just some meal alone, but this was a sacrifice. And they had a tender heart of Mary. And he learned from them by watching them at Mass uh, how to be uh, more tender and careful with our Lord. And he was given this privilege because of his great his great chastity, to care for the body of Christ. Now, this stands in great contrast to St. Mary Magdalene, who we talked about yesterday, right? She was not a virgin, but she's a great saint, one of the greatest saints. Because she sinned greatly, but she repented greatly. She depended greatly. She loved greatly. And so, 
If we committed even one sin against the sixth commandment in our life, right? Then we're like Mary Magdalene. Even if we commit one, we're like Mary Magdalene. And we don't despair, right? Because our Lord raised her up to the heights of sanctity. But we want to promote the ideal of John. We want to promote virginity for the sake of the kingdom. And our kids and our culture. Our Lady, when she appeared in Quito, Ecuador in the 1600s to Sister Mary Torres de Jesus, she said in the second half of the 20th century, this is 300 years before this last 50 years, she said, that there'd be hardly any virginal souls left in the world. Now, if I rewind the tape, the 1940s, the 50s, 30s. Hugh Hefner, when he went to college, was a virgin. And that wasn't unusual. Because during his time, statistically, the vast, vast majority of people were virgins until they were married. He went to one liberal professor, had one liberal class, right? And he became one of the leaders of this evil movement we call the sexual revolution. Virginity is not the odd thing. Virginity is the norm. Virginity gives the heart and prepares one for marriage or the priesthood or the nunnery or the convent, the monastery, whatever our vocation, virginity prepares that heart well to give out of love, to sacrifice out of love. It is the standard. It's not what should be unusual. So we need to pray uh, for virgin souls. We're going to pray for virgin souls because their prayers are more powerful than most other people's. All these nuns who are locked away in convents, offering sacrifice, and their virginal hearts merit more grace than we can imagine. Right? During the French Revolution, the devil hates their virginity, obviously. The French Revolution, what happened when they wanted to attack the church? they started closing down the cloistered convents. They didn't close down the convents of nuns who were teachers or nuns who worked in hospitals. So they said, hey, you doing physical things, well, that's good for society. You can pray a little bit. We don't care about that. But you who don't, you're, you're, they call them a leech of society. You're, you're sucking in society's goods. You who are away doing sacrifice and prayers in convents. A famous scene, there's a movie based on it, the, um, the Carmelites of Champagne. Right? The whole Carmelite monastery was beheaded for their bride, Christ, right? The the devil knew if I can get rid of these convicts, I can get rid of their contemplative prayer and their merit and their virginal uh, prayers. Something right now is happening very wicked in the church. Over the last eight years, there have been countless monasteries in Europe closed by the Holy See. The virginal nuns, some of them 80 years old, 85 years old, their monastery is old at the 12th, 1200s. And their monasteries, which are worth a lot of money, oh, somehow get taken up by some men and some, some prelates, and their monasteries are sold for cash, right? It's, it's wicked. It's evil, right? The devil is trying to take out the Air Force, the Navy SEALs, right? The, 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 that's our Navy SEALs, <laughs> That, that's our that's our our go to team. That's special op six, right? Is, are the are the are the cloistered nuns and the cloistered monks? So we need to pray for virginal souls. But our Lord said, uh, uh, "Pray that the Lord send harvesters for the harvest. For many are chosen, but few. Uh, many are called, but few are chosen. Right? Pray for more harvesters. Pray for more virgin souls. And so we need to expect the next generation. We have to expect them to be virgins." That's the expectation. No matter what you did before, no matter how you sinned or whatever before, it doesn't matter. We need to expect the next generation for their own happiness and glory and virtue and self-gift and the stability of their vocation, whether it's marriage or supernatural vocation. Uh, And that means that we have to do some rough things, right? If TV is causing unchastity in the house, it needs to be either taken out or severely locked up except for when mom and dad are able to, um, to, 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 to monitor it, right? 
I, I, I don't see, I don't see how it's not a mortal sin to give a 14 year old or younger or 15 year old or younger uh, 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 an iPhone that has no limits on it, that has no accountability software, and that has no way for the parents to monitor everything actively. How is that not a mortal sin? Like nine year olds are watching things that we couldn't even imagine that are permanently disfiguring their brain, which is in development, and leave scars on their soul and their memory that are crippling. Like we parents like will be held accountable at the end of time for what they gave their kids. Can't be it's it's time to get off the couch and monitor our kids' things with vigilance. And if you don't have time to monitor them, then give them a flip phone. Some of my, my grandma has this little old phone. She has buttons on it, big old buttons, <laughs> right? Get one of those. Like, mom, I'm such a loser with these. Well, you'll have a happier marriage, kid. Suck it up, All right? So one thing that's very powerful, the saints talk about, is praying three Hail Marys every day for chastity. If you're a father or if you're a grandfather, every morning when you wake up, you get on your knees and you pray three Hail Marys for the chastity of your kids and your grandkids every day, right? Because you, as a grandfather, you're going to merit, and as a father, merit grace for your kids that no one else can. When you took those vows in marriage at the altar, God gave you actual graces that you can tap into, meaning that he multiplies in ways you can't imagine the power of your prayer and your sacrifice when it's done for your spouse and for your kids. And so the saints say, pray the three Hail Marys, for purity, for chastity. The key, St. Philip Neri points out, other people point out, to, to breaking the cycles of lust is mental prayer, meditation. You can't have both at the same time. One of them will give way eventually. In one house, cannot occupy. Uh, you, cannot, you cannot have both on chastity and both um, mental prayer. It's like Alabama. You can't have uh, Bama fans and Auburn fans <laughs> in the same house. One's got to leave eventually, right? Um, and so keep your mental prayer. Doing 10 minutes a day of meditation on the scripture of the day, right? Keep that going, right? It's going to bring you light and grace. We need to teach our kids. Kids, it's amazing. Kids can enter into the depths of spirituality and prayer much, much faster than we can. But they're not jaded yet. They're not they're not burned by the world yet. They have a childlike heart. The kids love repetition. Heaven is going to be repetition. <laughs> so Chesterton said, uh, uh, you know, like when you throw a kid in the air, a dad throws a kid in the air, what, what does the kid say? Do it again, dad. You do it. He said, do it again, dad. Do it again. You never get bored. A kid never gets bored, right? Heaven won't be boring if we have a childlike heart. And so we, even though prayer might be drudgery sometimes, we got to go out and, and do it. Uh, for the joy of the kingdom. All right, so this is the first. We want to pray like John. We have to pray with chastity. Second thing we do, we have to pray with wonder. Wonder or awe is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit we often uh, don't speak on very much. John is often depicted in art as an eagle. One of the gospel writers is depicted as a man, one as an ox. John is depicted as an eagle. The eagle soars and sees the big picture. So John's gospel is the last to be written. He fills in details that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John don't. Matthew and Mark, excuse me, Matthew and Luke, their prologues, the beginning of their gospels, begin with Christ's human genealogy from Adam to Joseph and Mary. But John goes higher up. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John is trying to see the big picture. He's using the same language as Genesis. He's making it clear that through Christ, there's a recreation a redemption, just as all things were created through Christ, all things are being renewed and recreated and redeemed through Christ. John is seeing the bigger picture. John alone covers 
the, the, the discourse, the bread of life discourse in John chapter 6 about the Eucharist. John alone includes the high priestly prayer and Christ's last words to the apostles, John 13 to 18. John 13 to 18 is the most important part of the New Testament. Go back to the Old Testament for a second to the temple, right? The temple was made of different compartments, right? You had the holy, the holy, holy, and the holy, holy, holy. In Hebrew, kadosh. Hebrew, they don't have a superlative. So uh, Cajuns don't either, right? So if a gumbo is good, you say it's good, good. If it's really good, you say it's good, 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 <laughs> really fast, right? In Hebrew, same thing. The holy place is called the kadosh. The holy, holy, the kadosh, kadosh. A holy, 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 kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. What's that in Latin? Sanctus, sanctus, sanctus. And then the kadosh, I think we can go in there. The kadosh, kadosh, only the priest can go in there. The kadosh, 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 only the high priest alone once a year could go in. And so the Bible is in some sense structured in both testaments, both covenants as the temple. The most important part of the Old Testament is the Pentateuch. The most important part of the New Testament are the Gospels and the Acts, the Apostles, both five books. Right? So the rest of the Bible is called the Kadosh, the Holy. The Pentateuch and the Gospels with Acts, that's the Kadosh, Kadosh, where you get deeper in the mystery. Genesis 1 through 2 in the Garden, that's the Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. This part of where John reveals uh, Christ, last words to his apostles, right? When he says, I am the true vine with the branches, without me, you could do nothing. Do not be afraid. I have left many mansions for you in heaven. I'm not going to leave you orphans. It's the most beautiful, spiritually rich part of the New Testament, of the whole Bible. And really, our theology of grace is found there. That the grace is so powerful that it can cooperate in us and move in us and be in us where it still doesn't violate our freedom. We cooperate with it, with it but it's still God and still us. That God wants a union uh, in our hearts. And so when you read uh, John uh, 14 and 13 through 18, you're filled with awe, you're filled with wonder. At the cross, John is often depicted as standing behind either Mary or Mary Magdalene. Right. Mary Magdalene, we said yesterday, is on her knees, close to the dust in humility. Our Lady is standing, Stabat Mater, standing to support her son. And John's kind of taking it all in like the eagle. Just looking at the whole big picture. He's in silence, in awe. It's such an important part of prayer. Without awe, without any reverence, without any wonder, we can't get into uh, the new holy land. Remember the Old Testament? They had the manna. Every day they wake up in the morning and there was miraculous bread on the ground and they called it manna. Manna is Hebrew for what is this? It's a question. What is this? And it said that, <coughs> said that uh, eventually they grumbled after, after uh, years of this. Why are we getting this manna every day? The familiarity breeds contempt. They stopped asking the question, what is it? They were done with it. There's a danger we could do that with the Eucharist, right? We can lose our wonder. Mana, what is it? What it who is this? And even though we know the answer, it's, it's Christ, we can't fully exhaust that question. So if our, our mind, our body are fatigued, and it's hard for us to engage, we should ask a question. A question that can't be exhausted. Who is this? Who is the Lord? What is the Eucharist? Who is the Eucharist? Right? John begins his gospel right at the bat with that, right? The beginning was the word, the word was God, the word with, with, was with God. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> we know it means that he's God, but what does it mean that it's three persons and one God? What does it mean that Christ is the divine logos, that he is the divine logic, that he's the divine reason, that all things were created through him? What does that mean? We're not going to exhaust that question, so we shouldn't stop asking it. So Moses, for most of his ministry, had all and had wonder. The ten plagues in Egypt, all right? How did the how did the Nile turn to blood? How did how did all these mosquitoes and frogs and locusts appear out of nowhere? 
How is it that this lamb, the lamb, this unblemished lamb, its blood saved the firstborn of the Israelites? How did this Red Sea open up for us? How did the bread up on the ground? How did the water come from the rock? How did the quail end up every day on time for dinner time? Every day. So Moses, though, lost all toward the end of his ministry. Right? He's at Meribah and Massa, and he was told before that when the people are thirsty, bang the rock one time with water, with your staff, and water would come out. And that happened before when they were thirsty. But this time, God told Moses, whisper to the rock. <laughs> well, it looks kind of weird, right? You want to, <laughs> people would think, Moses is going to they're going to think I'm crazy if I whisper to a rock, you know? And he's aggravated because they're complaining. He, it's, a, he's a, it's a long day. He's just, he's, <laughs> the Israelites are, are just grumbly people. <laughs> Those of you who have parents or parents understand, right? Uh, right? Those of us who are priests understand, right? Uh, and so instead of whispering the rock, which would take, which would, would it engage all in wonder, he took his staff and banged it not once, but twice. Right? He took control. Control is the opposite of receiving. Control is the opposite of awe and wonder. This is why I love in the traditional Latin mass, the canon is silent. Something mystical is happening. Lovers don't shout at each other. They whisper to each other. If you go to uh, Rome, and go to the, all the ancient basilicas. Go to St. Peter's. Look at Bernini's columns surrounding the high altar. And if you look up on the, <coughs> excuse me, all the columns, there are little hooks where there used to be curtains. At the Sanctus Sanctus Sanctus, it would actually close the curtains. So the Pope would speak the canon in silence and behind curtain. If you ever go to a Byzantine liturgy, Right? They closed the great door, the icon door, iconostasis of the Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. And, the, and he speaks in silent, facing the east. Right? Think about the awe. We said when John would give communion to Our Lady every day. Who am I? He's probably thinking, who am I to give the mother of God, the new Eve, her son, her divine son? She's kneeling, he's standing. Who am I to do this? When, she, when he put the body of our Lord in, in her hands, the cross. Remember, John saw the big picture. He probably thought of, or Mary thought of Eve. Eve was the first lady of sorrows, right? Eve cried while she was weeping, leaving Eden. And Cain killed her son Abel. And she had to hold the dead body of Abel in her arms and realize that she had not sinned and not induced Adam to sin. Then her son would be alive this moment. That's a type foreshadowing Mary who did not sin, who did not deserve this pain and sorrow. But she consented out of love for the Father, the love for the Son, the love for the Holy Ghost, and love of us. She consented to offer her her son uh, to the father. When she said, let it be done to me according to thy word, she meant it, no matter what the pain, no matter what the cost. Probably not even fully understanding what would happen at the moment of the Annunciation, but she stuck by her vow. She stuck by her promise. And John's just looking at this in awe and wonder. Who am I to be in this moment? What does this mean? How is this the Messiah? John, he's very different. His gospel is very different than the other gospels. And he has what's called the uh, I am statements. Remember Moses? He saw the burning bush. He went up and he encountered God. God said, take off your shoes, take off your sandals. And Moses asked God, what is your name? And God said, I am. I am. My essence is to exist. God's essence is to exist. That's how Thomas understands that saying, I am. God exists. He, his essence is to exist. We can't comprehend fully what that means. And so seven times in John's gospel, John records every time our Lord said, I am. Right? Christ said in John's gospel, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. 
I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection of life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the true vine. Seven times he said, ego e me, I am. He's making it clear that he is God. The same God who talked to Moses from the burning bush. And it says in John's gospel, when he was getting arrested by Judas, and Judas was leading the guards to arrest Christ, the guards asked Christ, are you Jesus of Nazareth? And he said, what? Ego e me, I am. And the guards, it says, fell down in the moment. Remember, yes, it's Sunday, transfiguration. Peter, James, and John, they saw our Lord in transfiguration, and they fell down in wonder. When our Lord said, I am, he spoke those powerful words. It was like a force, and it caused the guards just to fall down. And Christ has given us a glimpse of his divinity and a glimpse of his power. And he chooses not to do anything. He's just standing there. And they get up. The guards kind of haphazardly get up and kind of touch him, kind of scared, and they arrest him. And Christ doesn't resist. The awe of what it means for Christ to say, I am. So we have to pray like John with uh, chastity, with a pure heart. We have to pray uh, with wonder. And all this, both wonder and chastity, is fed by devotion uh, to the sacred heart. John had the privilege of of putting his head on the heart of our Lord. But not only that, (coughs) John makes connections where no one else does. Ezekiel, he was a priest of the temple in the Old Testament. The temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, which is devastation, right? You can't have religion without a sacrifice. You can't have a sacrifice of the temple. Uh, the, the priest and the people are devastated. How is our religion going to continue? So Ezekiel has a, a dream, a prophecy, where he sees a new temple being built, a new everlasting temple. And that from its side, water and blood would flow and the water and flow would become a deep, deep, deep flowing river that would irrigate these trees whose leaves would be medicinal, whose leaves would be healing. And John connects that to Christ's passion. When he dies, he's pierced, his heart's pierced, and blood and water flow out. Christ is the new temple. In three days, you will destroy this temple, and I will rebuild it. Christ is the new temple. Water and blood flow out. You think of water, you think of what? Baptism. You think of blood, you think of what? The Eucharist. From the heart of Christ comes mercy. From the heart of Christ comes the church. From the heart of Christ comes his mystical body, us. From the heart of Christ comes the sacraments. Whose leaves are medicinal. Whose leaves are salvific. Whose leaves are healing. Whose church winds like a river throughout the entire human race throughout time. John makes that connection. John, he's at the Last Supper, and he can hear Christ's heart beating longer and and, and, and heavier. The devotion to Sacred Heart is critical for our times. Because we kind of live in an intellectualism age mixed with anti-intellectualism. So, the period, philosophically, the period before this current period is called modernity. We're right now in post-modernity. And during modernity, there was this idea that human reason can solve all problems. Now, human reason is good. God gave us reason. And God wants us to explore the universe. He wants us to understand uh, physics and chemistry and biology and medicine and art and music. He wants us to explore the beautiful universe he's given us. But our reason, we have to, in all humility, admit, even though it's good and can learn a lot, still limited. It's unreasonable, unreasonable. That's the irony. It's unreasonable to think you can know things without God. And so the arrogance of the Enlightenment period, the arrogance of modernity, is to think we can know things without God. And C.S. Lewis called that uh, a head without a heart, a head without a chest, a floating head, which ends up, beca- ends up into, t- turns into, Tyranny. It always turns to tyranny. Uh, when people are overly intellectual, they become tyrants. Uh, my favorite example, it's sad, but a fair example of, of this in action is when uh, George Washington dies or he's sick. He's sick. He's not dying. He's sick. And so the, the best doctors of the day say, well, we need to take the disease out of your blood 
So they bled him, all right? And he bled to death, right? The Anthony Fauci of his day, <laughs> right? The best doctor of the day, the most rational person on the, right? So this is what you gotta do. All right, doc, you say so, all right? And, and he died, right? We haven't, we haven't even explored 1% of the ocean floor, right? We don't even understand the human body, the immune system, right? For so long, we thought the tonsils and the appendix were useless or vestiges of evolution, they said. But now we know they're part of our immune system. We don't understand the climate that well. We don't understand the body that well. We don't understand the stars that well, right? We, we have some basics here and there, but we have to be humble enough to know we have a lot more to learn. And so when you look at the heart of our Lord, it kills intellectualism, right? Because it's love. It's love beating for us, right? That pride dissipates in humility. Christ is vulnerable. He rips his heart out to us. He shows the heart out to us. So we want to be vulnerable back. When someone's vulnerable to you, the normal thing is to be vulnerable back uh, to them. And so Christ is wooing us in humility and love. We also live, but we live in an age where it's a combination of both intellectualism, but also anti-intellectualism. This kind of hatred of reason also, right? And so when you look at the heart, it moves you to love, but it's also reasonable and rational, right? It's, it's logical, right? Every symbol in the heart means something. Well, you have it beautifully on your altar, right? I mean, on the altar repose, you have the thorns, which represents what? Uh, the, the lack of trust we have for our Lord, and that causes him pain. The, the fire represents the fire of the Holy Spirit, the passion our Lord wants to pour the Holy Spirit into our hearts. The cross represents the passion of Christ, right? The crown sometimes put on there represents Christ's social kingship. So that's why the, the devotion to the holy face and the devotion to the heart of Christ is so important. Uniting heart and head. Uniting the whole person uh, in Christ. So John learned more from the heart of Christ than studying textbooks of theology or seminary. He learned much. He learned how to sit in front of the Lord. After Mass, I'm sure Our Lady would just spend time in prayer, and John learned from her how to grow in prayer. There are different stages of prayer. And so we have to have mental prayer. We have to have meditation. We're using our mind to think about and pray about the Gospels. From that, we'll move into more effective prayer or silent prayer. We're just sitting for the Lord, looking at him. That's why adoration is so, so important, right? Because in adoration, um, you're exposed and all in wonder to what is this. It doesn't look like anything. It looks like bread. It doesn't smell like anything. It smells like bread. But you have to ask the question, mana, what is this? Who is this? And in that monstrance is the sacred heart of our Lord. And you hear it beating right, uh, for us, waiting for us. And so in, in, in adoration, sometimes we get bored. And that's good. I remember my dad dragging me to adoration one time as a kid and getting bored, you know, after 20 minutes, you don't know what to do when you're a small kid or whatever, a teenager. And that's good because in that boredom, you're able to distinguish God's voice from your voice. Boredom is the platform where creativity and life and true prayer uh, spring up. So uh, in order to uh, grow in prayer, we have to be close to the sacred heart of our Lord. So lastly, I want to just talk very briefly, very quickly about uh, Mary, right? We have to pray through Mary and to Mary, right? And so if you are not consecrated, consecrated Our Lady, uh, please look into that. We have you know, the most famous one by Lou de Montfort, uh, made popularized by the book 33 Days of Morning Glory. Uh, Maximum Colby, he, man, Maximum Colby is an awesome saint in the last century. He had his own consecration prayer. You can look at that one. But um, John learned to look at the cross through the eyes of Mary. When he prayed, he prayed in a sense through Mary. When he meditated on the cross, he looked at the cross through the eyes of Mary. And so when we pray our rosary, when you do the station of the cross, it's good for us to do it through in Mary's eyes. So we ask John to teach us to pray uh, with chastity, with awe, and devotion to the sacred heart of our Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen.
Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning, weeping this valley of tears. Turn, then, most gracious advocate, the eyes of mercy towards us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, the Holy Mother of God. St. Monica, St. Augustine, and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.